purpose of this morning will be given by Mariana. Mariana is a good uh, friend from uh, North Carolina now. North Carolina. Exactly. Uh, she's Mexican, but she's living in the US. So, well, she will speak about branch distribution equations and their applications. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Thank you, Andrea, for organizing this and for having you here. I am Mexican, I do speak Spanish, uh, so if at any point you have a question and you want to ask in Spanish, feel free to do so. Otherwise, I will continue in the language of the workshop, which will be English. So this is meant to be a five-day course, and because we are trying, and I was instructed by the authorities here to make sure we had some open questions, this is going to be organized in sort of a funny way uh, because I want to tell you a lot, about, a lot of things about an object that I've been studying for many years called random distributional equations, but to make sure we have a little bit of open problems that are get started early, I would not present this in the order in which I would probably normally do so. So let me start the mathy way and just tell you what these subjects are, start with a couple of very simple examples. And then we'll move forward into trying to describe the subject, and I'll leave the applications and the motivation, and what are the, the real reasons why we study these things until hopefully tomorrow. Okay, so let's start the mathy way today. And I will do so by giving you one of the first examples of a distributional equations that you can think of. I actually have a degree not in math, but in applied and management science and engineering. I've been a probabilist all my life, but, uh, but technically I'm an engineer. And applied probability, at least in the US, usually means that if you're doing probability in an engineering school, you're doing queuing theory. So let me motivate everything with a queuing example. Queuing, in case you haven't heard it, the translation is teoría de colas. I've never quite liked that in Spanish, how that works out, but you know. Queuing theory is basically any process where people have, or people, customers, jobs have to stand in line to wait to be served, and you have many different kinds. Let me start with the most simple case of a queuing, um, of a queue that we have, which is what we call the single server queue. And to make it sort of fun, let's think about an ice cream cart. The old fashioned way, or if you want raspados, Part of frozen treats, one person is there serving, and throughout the day, people, customers wanting to get an ice cream or a raspado, will come in and will approach the stand, and you know, will take some time deciding what flavor, you know, you know what uh, what flavor choices are, what they want to choose, how many, etc., to buy. Then the same person who is working at the stand will provide, will serve everything, and then the person, once they get their ice cream, will walk out of the, of, of the line, right? Customers arrive one at a time, let's make it simple, and we're just gonna assume that they arrive the renewal process of your choice. If it's easier to think about, think about a plus on arrival, where inter-arrival time, the times in between customers arriving, are IID random variables, not negative random variables. So, any renewal process will one they will join a queue, they will go immediately to order to place their order in case there's nobody there already. And if there's somebody there, they will join the queue. The idea is they will be served in a first come, first serve basis. So whoever comes get comes in first gets served. will spend a random amount of time between placing order, getting the ice, actual ice cream, paying, and then leaving, which we're going to call the service time. And again, I'm going to assume that customers have IID service times, you know, whatever distribution you want. Again, non-negative since we're talking about time. I'm going to define something called the waiting time, and that's going to be WN, and that's the waiting time of the nth customer. So if I'm the 17th person to come into this ice cream stand, what is the probability that I have to wait more than five minutes? Or what is the probability that I may not have to wait at all in case that, you know, when I get there, there's nobody there, right? This is called the waiting time of the nth customer. And it usually, well, we can define it excluding the service or including the service. I'm going to define it for simplicity here just the, the actual waiting. In queuing theory, we sometimes you might see in books that it also includes a service time, 
and some authors will call that the sojourn time. Either one would work, but let's keep it simple here. This is just the time between your, arri your arrival and the time that you get to speak to the person to place your order of ice cream, okay? If you think about this random quantity, the amount of time that the nth plus one customer will have to wait, well, there's a chance that when that person arrives, there's nobody at the ice cream cart, in which case they will not have to wait anything. So that gives me this zero over here, yeah? Or it may be that there are people in front of it, in which case the person who just arrived will have to wait whatever the person in front had to wait, plus the amount of time that it takes that person to place their ice cream order and leave, that we're gonna call here the, oh, I believe I have a typo, that should be a chi, chi in over here, not V. I will fix that. Uh, and then, of course, of that amount of time, some of it, the new person who just arrived wasn't there, right? So some of that waiting of the person in front has already elapsed, in which case we subtract how much of it that waiting of the person in front has already occurred by the time that this new person arrives. Does that make sense? So in other words, I have that the waiting time of the nth plus one customer can be written recursively in terms of the waiting time of the person in front plus something that is independent of everything else. Okay. That's a distribution, that's an equation, right? It's an actual sample path equation. Let's call that increment xn, just so that you can see how these things start popping up. And, you know, just for simplicity, again, let's assume that at time zero, say that, you know, eight in the morning, 10 in the morning, whenever the, the ice cream person comes and starts working, there's nobody there. So no, no customers have gathered by the time that the ice cream stand opens. In that case, the first customer who arrives will have no waiting, right? Because he's the first one, there was nobody there. And the second customer to arrive well, as we said before, it may be that the first person already left, in which case when the second person comes in, no waiting happens. Or it may be that the first person is there. So if I plug in the equation from before, then what I'm going to get is x1, which is that, that first increment, the v1 minus tau 2. Iterating again, I get that the waiting time of the third person is going to be the maximum of 0 of x2, and of x1 plus x2. You keep going in this fashion. It's not that hard to see, you can work it out yourself, that the waiting time of the nth plus one person can be recursively written, well, can be written in terms of all those x's the way that I just did here before. Basically, I have the maximum of zero, then the last of those increments, then the last plus the previous one, then the last plus the previous plus the previous previous, and so forth, all the way until I get to this point. Now, because I made sure that everything was IID, the order in which these x's appeared is, has the same distribution if I reverse, if I flip the index indices, and instead of starting with the n here, I start with a 1 and reverse everything from there, in which case, in distribution, not sample pathways, but in distribution, this waiting time has the same distribution as the maximum of zero of one of the x's, of, the, of one plus another, of one plus another plus another, and so forth. This guy over here you may all recognize is something we call a random walk, right? So in other words, the waiting time of the n plus one customer has the same distribution as the maximum of the random walk. This is something that in queuing theory, again, we teach probably in the first or second lecture. So it's standard to, take the, to, to see how these things start popping up. And it will help me explain later when these things get a little bit more complicated. Now, we do know that a random walk can do one of three things, right? Depending on its drift. If the mean of the increment is strictly positive, we all know that the random walk will go to infinity almost surely. If the drift is negative, the mean of the, the random wall will go to minus infinity, almost surely. And if it's exactly zero, it will oscillate forever and ever and ever in such a way that it keeps coming back, although it keeps coming back in an expected amount of time that is infinite. 
Now, if we think about this maximum of the random walk, well, if the walk eventually is going to go to minus infinity, that is if the expected value of the increment is negative, that means that eventually it will never go up again, right? And it will attain a finite maximum value, right? In other words, we just showed that the waiting time, which is equal in distribution to the maximum of the random walk, whenever the random walk has negative drift, will converge in distribution to some random variable, let's call it W, which is the all-time maximum of a negative drift random walk. Again, this is convergence in distribution because this is not sample path inequality. This is distributional. Now, taking that equation that we derived on the previous slide, this one over here, well, if there's a limit as n goes to infinity of this guy, well, that limit has to be the same as this guy. These all have the same distribution, so taking the limit here as n goes to infinity, the limit here and replacing this by one random variable having that distribution, what we get is that that limit that we argue that exists must satisfy this distributional equation. In other words, W must be equal in distribution to the maximum of zero and an independent copy of itself plus the increment. Here this increment, I'm going to drop the index since it's just one having the same distribution as these increments over here. Right? This is my first example for you of what we call a distributional fixed point equation. And this is a very, very, very famous fixed point equation called the Linley equation. It's perhaps the simplest example of a distributional equation, and it's the one we know pretty much everything there is to know about. Sorry? W, this W and the X, yes, they're independent. If you look at the structure, you can see that, um, like if you see it in the pre-limit here, this guy is cause it has nothing to do with this guy, right? So this, is a, this part is independent of this one, and that property is preserved through the limit. So this guy here is Lindley's equation, and it's, a, as I said, my first example of a distributional equation. You get a feeling of what a distributional equation is now? Basically, what we're talking about is some random variable on the left that, can have, that has the same distribution as some mapping of the same random variable on the right. That's the simple case of a distributional equation. Let me keep moving a little bit forward and let's talk about a different kind of process. I know several people here will be talking about branching processes, so let me just start with the simplest one. And I'm sure we'll get to hear about more complicated examples later in the week. Let me talk about the Galton-Watson process, or the standard branching process, or whatever you want to call it, proceso ramificación in Spanish. Let's suppose, I always like to think about this as some crazy guy who decides that he wants to be original and changes his last name. For all of you who are Mexican or are familiar with his Hispanic in general traditions, the way that we inherit pass along last names is that everybody, every male individual passes on their last name to their offspring, but the women, we pass our last name as a second, as a maternal last name, so it, it dies the next generation, even so if we have daughters, our grandchildren will not have our name, but if I am a male, then my grandchildren will continue having my name, and as long as I have a line of male descendants, the last name will keep going forever and ever. So for whatever reason, this one individual decides to choose a very, very interesting, funky, whatever last name. He, wants, he wonders, well, how many generations of my descendants is this last name going to survive? Right? Now, let's suppose that this individual will have a certain number of offspring, of children, according to some distribution, let's call it F. And that each of those offspring, when time comes, and here I'm only looking at generations, I don't care how long they live, just looking at the generational tree, not the time version of it, then any, every, every one of those offspring will again have offspring on their own, and the number of offspring they have will also have distribution F, but it will be independent of everybody else. So, so two brothers will have a certain number of male descendants independent of each other, but with the same distribution. And then the grandchildren, male in this case, since I'm tracing their last name, 
will again have a number of descendants in the same way independently of everything else. This process, if what I'm looking at is the number of individuals in the nth generation who carry this funky last name, this I'm going to call the n, this receives the name of a branching process or a Galton-Watson process. Mm -hmm. Questions on that? Well, this is a Galton-Watson process. And if you use these letters, these random variables, ni to be iid uh, uh, versions of that, with that uh, random variables of that distribution f, then it's not very difficult to see that the number of offspring in the n plus 1 generation carrying the last name is equal in distribution to the sum of as many offspring, of as many p individuals having that last name in the previous generation, each of those having a random number of offspring having distribution f, right? So this one is uh, usually the standard one that you will find in books. And I'm just giving it to you so that you recognize it if you've seen it before. On the other hand, I can think about it a little bit differently. I can say, let's focus on the first generation of individuals and say, well, how many individuals are going to have the last name in generation 100? Well, let's look at all the ones in the first generation. Let's say that there were five individuals in the first one. Each of those will have descendants. Now, not for 100 generations, but for 99 generations in the future, right? To get to a 100 at the end. And each of those will have a certain number of descendants carrying the last name. That gives rise to the second distributional equation on the side. Here, what I'm summing is I'm splitting over the number of offspring that my first person has. And each of those will have a number of descendants of generation n that is independent of all the other subtrees, as we will see, and they have the same distribution as the n. So what I'm doing is I'm looking rather than at the n, which is this version over here, I'm looking at the beginning. And I get another distributional equation. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of any of this. Many of you, you may already be familiar, and if not, you know, I'll be happy to, to talk about it offline. But there's a lot of theory uh, about branching process again. It's a, it's a very well-known process. And as a matter of fact, it turns out that even though it does not necessarily converge, there's, again, a simple story that we can tell. Just like the random walk, there's a basic set of possibilities that could happen with this branching process. Eventually, you know, the, there may, they, this number of descendants may die. If at some point nobody has any male descendants, the last name dies. That's one possibility, right? There's also the possibility that at some point there's so many descendants that what's going to happen is that basically the probability of, of none of them at some point having offspring is so low that rather than dying, the last name will continue forever. Think about the Lopez's of the word, of the world, right? The Lopez, the Sanchez. Chances are, you know, this is an exploding situation, and we'll, you'll never be able to eradicate the last name. On the other hand, if you know if the expected value turns out to be exactly one, then you know you will die out. It'll take a while, but eventually it will die out. Those things are known, but let me focus instead of those sort of all or nothing stories, like the random walk, let me focus on something that actually converges to something non-trivial. Because it, on its own it doesn't quite converge, it either dies or it explodes. To make it converge, we're going to divide the number of offspring by the average number of offspring to the n. It's geometric growth, let's say. Right? This guy over here turns out to be a martingale. As a matter of fact, it's a non-negative mean one martingale. And because it's non-negative, it converges almost surely by the martingale convergence theorem. Hence, this martingale that I just constructed has a limit, which is finite almost surely, that we're going to call m as n goes to infinity. Now let's go. Yes? Again. I'm <laughs> sorry, it's a typo. It should be the n. It's just in some talks I use the n's, and some talks I use the um, the size. I, I will change that, and uh, as I asked Andreas, we won't post the slides until after, so I can correct those. Just keep telling me, and I'll I'll correct them later today. Thank you. So it's the end. 
So then uh, if we look again at that distributional equation from the previous slide, this one over here, now divide both sides by mu to the n plus 1 to make that martingale, mu to the n plus 1, mu to the n plus 1. I'm going to take n to put them here, but I'm going to still get 1 on the side, right? It turns out that by the same arguments that I used for the Lindley equation, the left-hand side is going to converge, the right-hand side is going to converge, and I'm going to end up with a distributional fixed point equation of this form, where the left limit, the, sorry, the, the limit on their left side must satisfy in distribution that it's equal, this is the one extra mu that I had left over, because I divided by mu to the n plus 1, not mu to the n, to the sum up to a random number of independent copies of itself on the right hand side. See the difference between this one and the Lindley equation is that in the, first, in the other one there only was only one copy of W on the left, one copy of W on the right. When I talk about branching distributional equations what I mean is that I have one copy on the left and then a bunch of IID copies of the left side on the right. This is the, what, we, what makes it branching. Everybody with me on this? Okay. In particular, this is a special case of something I will call the non-homogeneous smoothing transform. I will go into more details in a few minutes. Any questions so far? Let's keep moving towards more general branching equations. Again, I will leave the motivation of why we study this uh, things until a bit later. Because things get a little bit complicated really fast, let's try to organize our notation a little bit better than what I did before. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I, rather than just considering that Galton-Watson process that I showed you, I'm going to assume that I'm not only keeping track of the people, of the male individuals carrying the last name, but also of their fortune, let's say their, their, their wealth, the amount of money that they have. So this great individual at the beginning who decided that he was going to change his name to some serendipitous choice, right? He also happened to have very good luck in life and made one million dollars, one million euros, whatever it is that you want, and fortune. When he had offspring, male offspring, this is all very unfair, then some of that wealth got passed on to those offspring, and each of those offspring, some of them were very good at growing the money, and some of them may have not have been so good at doing so, so some of them will grow that inheritance, and some of them will diminish it, right, or even finish it altogether, it could be. And then whatever they are able to make during their life, they'll pass on again to the grandchildren, and the grandchildren will do the same thing, and will again either grow or decrease how much they inherit and uh, pass it on to the next generation. Now to keep track of all these passing on of, of wealth, I'm going to enumerate the individuals on the tree to keep track of who's who. And the simplest way to do that is to start with a great ancestor, and this is sort of a choice that I made many years ago, and we call it just the root, or the knot, or the empty set symbol to denote the first ancestor. And then the first ancestor's children are going to be called 1, 2, 3, up to n naught. The ancestor's great uh, grandchildren are going to have labels of the one, let's say 1, 2, or 1, 3, or 3, 4. For example, 3, 4 means that individual is the fourth offspring of the third of the third individual in the first generation, right? So basically, I'm choosing labels of this form that if you look at it, it tells you exactly the entire line of descendants of that individual. Does that make sense in terms of notation? I'm just adding one at the end every time. So if this individual has three, then the three offspring will have this label, comma one, comma two, comma three. To keep track of the number of offspring that each individual has, I'm just going to call those ends as before, and I'm going to give them as the index and individual they belong to. So if this label is 1, 2, 3, then this is the number of offspring that individual 1, 2, 3 had. Right? And using those, I'm going to construct the tree again 
as I did before, except now I'm going to make a distinction between just the number of individuals and the identities of the individuals by defining these sort of sets of labels or se sets of tagged individuals by saying that AK is a set of individuals in the kth generation of my process. So these are all the labels that have length K where each of the i's is a inter non-negative integer and has the property that if I consider a first k minus 1, this individual must be in the previous generation. And only labels that the last one can only be up to the maximum number of offspring right, that that individual, that their parent had. Using this notation, you can see that I recover the standard branching process by just taking the cardinality of that set. Those uh, either the making more money or, may or, or making less of the inheritance that they receive are going to be controlled by some weights that I'm going to call the C's. But again, this is a bit funny in the way that we do this. Those weights, I'm going to put those all in a mark assigned to the individual I. And to keep the notation short, I'm going to use both phase to say that this is one individual, it's a vector. And that one is going to have a mark, yes. Can you make a picture I'm not getting? I'm, I'm going to put the picture in the next slide. Okay. The next slide has a picture, thank you. It's just I need to introduce the notation and then I'll go back, back to, the, to this. And this mark belongs to the individual I. And there's reasons for doing that in such a way that we're going to assume that these guys are IAD. If all the C's were 1 and the Q was 1, we would get back to the standard tree, and all I'm saying is that the number of offspring are ID. Here's the picture that goes with it. So this is my great ancestor at the top. He has a weight of, or a fortune, a wealth of, let's say, 1 million euros over here. Start there. And then he's going to pass on that wealth to its three offspring in this case. Each of those is going to multiply the 1 million euros that they received by some fraction or by some quantity. Some of them may actually grow the 1 million and become even wealthier, right? So that means that it's gonna, they're going to multiply that 1 by some c bigger than 1. And some of them may actually make it smaller, in which case they'll multiply that 1 million by something smaller than 1. The next time I look at this is the total inheritance, <coughs> no, total wealth of the individuals in the first generation, which is basically C1 times 1, C2 times 1, C3 times 1. However, when I go to the next generation, these guys, the grandchildren, will inherit whatever they got from their immediate parent and multiply that by their own copy of this sort of individual fortune C, they're going to multiply it by C11 for this guy, by C12 for this guy, C21, C31, 32, and 33. So this is the recursive structure that we're having. So now I have these weights pi's and these multiplier C's. And the IAD nature, or what we call the branching property, is coming from these vectors being all IAD. And as I always say, like, these guys can be very, uh, very dependent, completely general in whatever you want to do. And if you might want to make it funny to remember it, imagine that first offspring, the firstborn, gets 90% of all the assets of the father. The second one could get 90% you know, of the remaining 10%. The third one, the United 90% of the remaining 0.1.1% and so forth. You can distribute it out however you want, and this structure of this process allows us to do so. So you can start by splitting it equally and then say, well, each one will technically be split equally, but will tend to multiply by something. So I'm not in directly, um, I'm not directly modeling how it's split originally, just the final outcome of what is multiplying the, the inheritance by. By something bigger than one, by something smaller than one, and this could be very different. This could be IID if you want to be fair and give all the offsprings the same amount. Originally, of course, each one will either be good at making good of that money or, or losing that money. That, that's going to happen differently, 
They could be dependent, maybe brothers get together and whatever one does, all of them do it, that's fine too. So in general, the structure of the branching process, of what we call the weighted branching process, can accommodate any choice of splitting the wealth that you may choose. Mm -hmm. This is a picture. Do you have any questions on the picture? QI, let's call that an environmental factor, and I haven't actually used it for anything yet. Uh, that's yet another external thing that you could think of. So imagine that uh, the way that I split the money among the offspring is, you know, as I said, half for the first one, half of the half for the second one, half of the half of the half for the third one, and so forth. So that gets split in one way, but on top of that, each person is going to have some extra randomness that has nothing to do with the parent, let's say, which I could model through this queue again. So it just gives me one extra degree of freedom to, to model a variety of things. Once I talk tomorrow about the specific examples and the motivating places where, where these things pop up, the queue will have a very specific meaning. For now, let's just keep it there just because we can, and you, you'll see that uh, it comes in handy in, in actual applications. So this is a tree, these are the weights, and let's take a look at a few functionals that I can construct on this tree. <coughs> to start, let me go back to that smoothing transformation, or smoothing transform, which I'll usually always refer just to as the linear equation. What I'm going to take over here, from that tree that I showed you, I'm going to sum all the weights pi multiplying by their copy of the Q, sum them everywhere from the top to the kth generation. I'm going to call that RK. Mm -hmm. So it's the sum of the weights. Again, the weights could even be negative if you want. So there, there's many interpretations here, but formally, as long as my N is finite almost surely, this is always well defined. If N is not finite almost surely, which we do normally allow, then you have to be careful, this would be only formally defined, may not actually exist, so with that caveat, you know. It may or may not exist, but in general, in the f at least for finite k, as long as the n is finite almost surely, then it always exists. So here the q is, okay. you multiply by the q. I'm multiplying by the q. If, you, if it makes it easier to understand, just make the q equals to 1, nothing happens. But the q matters for, for applications, so it's just another extra piece to you that you can use to model something. Now, if I look at this random variable over here that I constructed using the tree, again, by doing exactly what I did before with the branching process, by looking at the first generation of offspring, I would say, well, the total sum of the weights up to level k is the weight of the first ancestor, because his pi is 1, then that means only his q. Right? That's this guy, that's the top. And then I look at the next generation. <coughs> so now I look at this. So this is the one that multiplies the Q, so that's just Q. And then I look at all of these, and I have Q1 pi 1, Q2 pi 2, Q3 pi 3. Well, take out the C1, the C2, the C3, factor it out. And now look at the subtree divided by that, so remove that first C. And what you'll see is basically the same kind of structure going down on each of these three subtrees. Right? See that? It just repeats itself. Except now if I'm looking at k generations, well now the subtrees are of size or depth k minus 1. In other words, just as the examples that I showed you at the beginning, what I get is, a, is an iterative expression of the sum of, the de of all the weights up to k in terms of the sum of all the weights up to k minus 1 corresponding to the subtrees that originate on the first generation. Now this, by that IID assumption on the vectors, are independent of each other and independent of this c, this n, and the q. That's how I construct it from that branching property that I mentioned. That's where the IIDness comes from. It's sort of a, it's not quite a random environment in the sense that I think you're thinking, but uh, it's, it, to me it's always like something, an external extra source of randomness that is not attributed necessarily to the, to the tree itself. You can also pick it to be dependent on the tree, but I mean, again, this, this, then the modeling, it makes sense, and this is just something that 
mathematically we can incorporate. So now what I have again is the left hand side in terms of IID copies of something very similar to the right hand side. I'm not going to go into this and this I can't give you a proof like I did for Linley's equation or for the for the uh, martingale of the, the branching of the Galton of Watson process martingale but again there are ways to ensure that RK converges almost surely to a finite random variable and when we do what happens well when we can ensure the convergence of R of K then this left hand side and this guys on the right hand side must converge to the same thing in other words as long as we have conditions ensuring this we have a solution of these branching distributional equation. This is the general form of what we call the non-homogeneous smoothing transform. This is very similar to one I showed you before for the Galton process martingale, the M, except it has this Q. That's what makes it non-homogeneous versus homogeneous, whether the Q is there or not. Now, just like uh, the same kind of arguments that I just made, if you take not the sum of all the weights up to generation k, but only the weights on the k generation, it turns out that you can see that these w's, when a limit exists, and again, a limit exists, I usually need to tweak it to make sure that it exists, uh, but when it does exist for this limit, which is a case where the expected value of something is exactly equal to 1, if it does exist, then, and it converges to a w, Think about that as the Galton Watson Prost Martingale, it will satisfy this distribu distributional equation. This is the homogeneous smoothing transform. Again, in general, this WK as it's defined here will actually go. Okay, just a little quick question, quick exercise. If I claim that this is finite, that this limit exists, and I'm summing over all of them, what's happening to this guy under the conditions for which this occurs? What's happening to WK on its own? I'm summing weights here, 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 here. Think about the worst case scenario where actually my tree is blowing up to infinity. If it converges, what's happening to the weights on each further down generation? They're converging to zero, right? As a matter of fact, they're converging to zero geometrically fast. That's the only way in which this thing is actually finite. So under the conditions that R exists, this, this guy over here converges to zero, but again, there's a trick of dividing it by the mu to the ks before to make sure that it has a proper non-trivial limit, in which case we will get a solution to this. Okay? So this is homogeneous versus non-homogeneous. Again, I owe you the examples of where this comes from for tomorrow, but I can tell you right now that these are very important distributional equations mostly coming from the analysis of algorithms in general. For example, of divide and conquer algorithms. There's a very famous algorithm called quicksort that satisfies this. And my personal choice of, of work, Google's page rank algorithm on any kind of random graph that has enough structure to make this happen will also converge to a solution of this. So, Algorithms in general, where you're dividing and analyzing sort of in a distributed local way things, will tend to satisfy equations of this form. In particular, quicksort and page rank are very good examples of this. Branching random walk, again, is related to, to these guys. To, there's a martingale that is based on this that allows much of that analysis. And there are other functions related to the branching random walk that are related to these distributional equations. So this is a linear case. Just as I did with the linear case, let me go back to that maximum case, the Lindley equation, the Q. And again, I'll give you more examples later, but if I take on that tree now, not the sum of the weights, but the maximum weight among all the nodes up to the k generation, I'm going to call this k, this v is maximum. So not the sum, but the maximum. Then again, by splitting over the first generation, I can see that rk must be equal to the maximum of the first weight, which is just q, q naught, 
and the maximum of all the subcopies originating at the first generation individuals for going up to k minus 1 depth. Right? So same as before, I factor out the first multiplier c to take it out and then look at the independent copy that's left. And I get that this rk defined as the ma alta maximum of the generation k satisfies, as before, a distributional equation. In particular, in this case, again, if I can guarantee that a limit exists, then what we satisfy is the maximum equation, which is r is equal in distribution to maximum of q and the maximum of two n copies of these weights. These guys, remember, the c's, the n, and the q can be arbitrarily dependent, but these r's are iid copies independent of these vectors and copies of the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. This guy over here, we call it the maximum equation. And it's a very famous equation too, although you may not recognize it. Those of you who work on the branching random walk, let me help a bit. Let's assume that the c's are all non-negative and the q is non-negative. So I can go and take natural logarithm on both sides of this equation. And when I do so, in particular, I'm going to choose q to be equal to 1 so that everybody can see it. I define w to be the natural logarithm of r. Take logarithms on every side. A xj is the natural logarithm of the cj's. And what I get is that this equation is exactly this equation below. Right? So now I have that w is equal in distribution to the maximum of 0 and the maximum of n copies of itself plus these xj's. And this is basically, again, something related to the branching random walk because now these are my random walk increments as before. If I make n identically 1, I get back that first example that I showed you today, the Linley equation. So the name that this equation receives because of its connection to Linley's equation is just the high order Linley equation. Yes. So instead of taking the sum of all the weights, I'm taking the maximum of the weights. And then I get a solution to this maximum equation. And again, and in terms of the branching random walk, just take logarithm of everything. So I usually work on the, multiplica the multiplicative scenario where the pi's are, are multiples. You guys tend to work with the additive one. So I'll see the process of the one which is just killed when it goes negative. The first bit of path is behaving the same way, whereas before I kill it, I reintroduce it to a different point. And then it behaves in the same. I kill it, and then I reintroduce it at a different point. So, so, this so what's stretch the question? Path is essentially moving like a, another stable process. Given the, the reentry point, <laughs> okay. it continues as a stable process. So it means that surely, I mean, when is this, when are these reintroductions? This is the, yeah, this is going to give you the maximum. So if you're looking at the displacements in terms of a random walk, thinking like, wh who is the farthest one to right? This gives you the total range, right? Like the, the maximum uh, horizontal displacement. The all time, assuming that, again, for this to make sense, this needs to be true. And for that to be true, what's happening to my weights? They have to go to zero. Now take the logarithm of something that is going to zero, something smaller than one, there's your negative drift, right? So it's basically the same condition as before. If I have a branching random walk with negative drift, then this maximum spread is a well-defined quantity, and that's this uh, guy. The one associated with the killed... No, 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 the maximum spread. You know, eventually, everybody will, will die out, right? So, or will go to the, to the zero. But you will hit a maximum value as long as you tend to go to, to zero. So it's not, it's not zero. It's, it's, a, it's a non-trivial quantity. But it is finite. It won't blow up. Okay. That's basically the condition that's going to ensure that this is true. So again, this, is, this has important connections to, to some of you who work on, on that other field. Again, uh, throughout the week, I'm going to just sometimes refer to the most general case. So I've encountered many other examples of distributional equations. And I just like to put them in one big set up by saying, I'm looking at solutions R to a distributional equation of this form, where phi is some, let's say, deterministic map that takes as arguments some vector q and ci, possibly infinite. The ci's, I said before, 
So it's easier to think that this is finite, but it doesn't have to be. It actually can be infinite. In which case, these are just IID copies, an infinite number of those of the left-hand side. And this is sort of the most general way in which I can write these objects. Now, what's very interesting, and those of you who are very, very abstract-minded, is that even in the simplest cases, other than the Linley equation, these solutions, these uh, distributional equations do not have a unique solution. As a matter of fact, it might be a little bit puzzling to think about it, but the solutions that I showed you, and I did this in a constructive way, I, I showed you the solution and, and basically explained or argued that it solved that equation. But if I were to look at the, uh, from the other point of view and say, here's the equation, can you find me solutions? Well, there's infinitely many solutions. The ones that I showed you are very special. Some of my colleagues actually started calling them many years ago the special solution. Then I think we sort of settle into calling them the attracting endogenous solution. David Aldous used to call them endogenous. But then some of my colleagues said, well, even among endogenous, they're not all unique. So endogenous refers to the term that you can explicitly construct it within, with function, as functions of the tree. So that's what the endogenic part of the name comes from. But even among those, there's, there could be an infinite number of endogenous solutions and then after those, there's all these other solutions that are really, really weird and uh, difficult sometimes to understand what they are. Basically, these are non-attracting solutions that also solve this equation. Many times, they're functions of the special attracting, uh, attracting endogenous solution and stable loss. So you can think, does these things get really, really messy, really complicated, even in the very, very simple cases? So these two are important. In case you were curious, I'm not going to give you if and only if conditions for the existence of R, but this is a simple, sufficient condition. In many examples, it's satisfied. In some important examples, it's not. But basically, if I can find a beta between 0 and 1 for which the sum of the weights to the beta is strictly smaller than 1, then basically what it means is I can define a contraction on an suitable space in such a way that I can argue that that, because, uh, that, that contracting map has a, a, fixed point equa a fixed point solution, and therefore that's my solution, and that's sort of the way that the story goes. So this is a sufficient condition that ensures that those R cases converge to something finite. As I said, these special cases that I showed you are the attracting endogenous solutions to the, to the linear and maximum equations respectively. Here's a couple of other examples of something that are not related to, to those two. This is something that David Alder has discounted tree sums. At a different point. So it he has a compound a very nice survey paper of many so of these equations. I'm just the showing a couple. This is uh, that paper by David Alder has design. mostly just uh, max plus equations. So this is one example. You could also make another one. You have a maximum here and a sum here and all sorts of combinations. So this, guy this one has another one that is interesting. It's nonlinear, but also behaves very much like the ones that I showed you is an equation arising the from the analysis of the free entropy in the Easing model. Again, it, this could be the Easing model uh, on any kind of graph that has enough local tree-like structure. And if I look at that, then this is a free energy uh, equation at, at zero temperature. Well, no, well, the, the arc tangents is at positive temperature, I believe. And uh, well, the linear one is at zero or something like that. I'm not a physicist, so you get those a little bit mixed up sometimes, but I know that uh, they arise in that context. And again, because the tangent and the arc tangents and the hyperbolic cousins as well have enough linearity to play with, a lot of the analysis that we do for the linear and maximum cases carries on to those as well. So let me give you here a first question. It's not necessarily easy, but it's something I wanted you to think at least of the simple case. So these are explicit in the sense that I can construct them on the tree. However, they're everything but explicit in the sense that I don't know how they behave. I don't know what their distribution is. I will show you tomorrow with the examples that the question that we're many times interested in is what is the distribution of those solutions? Like, does it have fat tails? Does it have light tails? Does it have a mode? Does it look like a Poisson? Whatever it is that we may be interested, we really want sometimes to have an idea of what that solution looks like in terms of its, the shape of its distribution.
these expressions, as pretty as they may be, they're not explicit. It doesn't tell you anything about what their distribution is. So my first question to you is, can you find <coughs> any examples <coughs> with actual distribution? So pick n to be Poisson and pick the c's to be, I don't know, Weibull's and pick the, uh, the q's to be equals to 1 or whatever it is you need to do to say that these solutions have some distribution that you can at least compute in principle. To give you a little hint, there is one that humanity has solved for a long time ago, which is the non-branching case of Lindley's equation. As I said, that's one case where the solution is unique when it exists, and uh, there's at least one sec choice of distributions for which everything is explicit. My hint, if you, it's a good way to start thinking about this, is go and try to see if you can guess what I'm talking about. This is basic, you know, first course on stochastic processes kind of thing. And once you find it, you can see that uh, there is one solution that is explicit. The bigger question is, can you find any other explicit solutions for any of the other cases? So we have some in, my, my, one of my classes and I have been thinking for a while in some examples for the linear one where things may look explicit enough, but I think in general, this is a pretty hard problem, okay? But why don't you start thinking about the non-branching cases? Again, the non-branching linear case is an also a very well-known process called the autoregressive process of order one. So that's another very, very famous, well-known mathematical object that you may look at. I know I'm, uh, <coughs> and then, so let me just finish uh, showing you a couple, of, tell you a couple of things that will get me started tomorrow. Taking on that thing that I said about finding solutions, that's not an easy problem in general, at least for the branching case, it's not easy, which means we need to compute them. How do we compute them if they're not analytically available, right? What we want is some mechanism to do that. Well, because they're not that easy to compute, sometimes it's not even clear to know whether there exists a solution or not. Then we really are looking at mathematical, numerical methods to try to find whether solutions exist and what they look like. Now, based on what I said before, and assuming that you can ensure that the convergence of these RK is well established, I also sort of hinted at that if convergence is going to occur, it's going to be a very fast mode of convergence. Why? Because for things, for a geometric growing thing to converge, it has to go geometrically fast to zero, which means that if you chop off the last generations, you're really removing almost nothing relative to the top. So you have very quick convergence rates, which means that one idea is that let's see if we can construct just k iterations of those solutions, which is a more tractable problem than trying to construct the whole thing. And how do you do that? Well, you start iterating the recursion, starting with some initial distribution at the beginning, pick whatever you want, zeros, one, and then start plug it into here to get the next level, and then going up and up and up until you get to k. If you like uh, measure notation, just so to give you some context, then what I just described, everything I talked about, could be thought of as a map from the space of probability measures to the space of probability measures on the real line. So the map is t, and it takes measure nu to the distribution of phi of q and c's and x i's, where the x i's are i d with distribution nu. So it maps a probability measure to another probability measure. In that case, what I just described in terms of iterating to find the solution accounts to computing this measures nu k iteratively as t of nu k minus 1 and trying to get to that fixed point of that map, right? Again, you know, if you think about this from a Monte Carlo approach, what I just described is a fairly straightforward story on how you could do this. All I have to do is I have to take one ancestor and build my tree up to generation k and then iterate the map phi from the leaf to the root. That gives me one sample of my observation rk, right? <coughs> 
We call this the naive Monte Carlo approach. What do you think we call it? In this case, we have a naive Monte Carlo is sort of the first thing you can think of, but in this case, it's also very naive in this sort of silly kind of way. What do you think is that? Here's a hint. In a regular, like in a very, very simple, let's say, random graph, let's say I'll give you a little piece of Wikipedia, and I were to do this kind of exercise, I'm looking at a local tree where the average number of offspring is about 20 something. So what's gonna happen? Think about it for a minute. So as I said before, just quickly, well, if that is the case, that the same arguments that I showed on the geometric convergence rate say that I can only take the first k, I'm happy with just approximating this guy, I could try to just use that approach to simulate this guy, to create a realization of that, and here's the problem of why that doesn't work. So. What I want to do tomorrow is I want to pick up from here to tell you a little bit about how are some of the ways that we actually compute them and also use that to start telling you about where these problems come from, why we care, and why is it so important to us in, in studying those things to really be able to compute them and say something meaningful about these solutions. Okay? Questions? In that case, sorry, I went five minutes over, but... Uh, I started like 50 minutes over, so <laughs> I take it it's there. <laughs>